Good afternoon. I'm Albert Kern, a sale provost of Harvard University and dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. It's my privilege to welcome you here. This event is uh, sponsored by the Institute of Politics and by the Kennedy School's Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, the mission of the Kennedy School is to prepare leaders for public service in government and other institutions in democratic societies. And our speaker this afternoon has a direct personal investment in the school and in its mission. Indeed, his son, Scott, earned a degree here in city and regional planning in 1983. Observer and analyst uh, Edmund Burke, reflecting on statesmanship in the tumultuous period of the American Revolution and the French Revolution, wrote, a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve taken together would be my standard of a statesman, close quote. Uh, the career of our guest, Secretary of State Warren Christopher, meets the highest standards of public service and statesmanship, and it deserves both the study and emulation. The son of a bank cashier, he was born in Scranton, North Dakota, at the dawn of the Great Depression. The family moved to California. His father died soon thereafter. His mother raised five children as a sales clerk. He managed to go to the University of Southern California, graduate from Stanford Law School, must have done reasonably well because then clerked at the Supreme Court for Justice William O. Douglas. He then became a private career long association with the prestigious California law firm O'Melveny and Myers, where in the last decade he served as vice president. Throughout his life, Warren Christopher has moved easily between private law and public service. In 1965, he served as vice chairman of the McCone Commission that investigated the riots in the Watts section of Los Angeles. Then President Lyndon Johnson appointed him as deputy attorney general with special assignments dealing with racial and urban unrest. In President Jimmy Carter's administration, he served as deputy secretary of state and then returned to the private practice of law. In 1992, he supervised Governor Bill Clinton's selection of a vice presidential candidate, who turned out to be Harvard alumnus Al Gore. And in 1993, President Bill Clinton appointed him Secretary of State. The New York Times has written, and again I quote, in this dissonant world of uncertainty, disorder, and fear, Warren Christopher sells confidence and trust Mr. Christopher brings extraordinary attention to detail, infinite patience, poise, sure judgment, and an abiding conviction that most disputes can better be resolved through talking than fighting. As Secretary of State, he has brought these qualities and more to a range of challenges, to building US support for democracy in Russia and Eastern Europe, to continuing and expanding the Middle East peace process, to dealing with nuclear proliferation issues involving Russia, China, and North Korea, to promoting global economic growth through NAFTA and the GATT, to ensuring economic stability for Mexico, and to striving for peace in Bosnia and more recently in Chechnya. I ask you to recall Edmund Burke's standard of a statesman a disposition to preserve, and an ability to improve. These qualities the Secretary has demonstrated in abundance, and we've never needed them as much as we need them now. Please join me in welcoming the United States Secretary of State, Warren Christopher. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I'm a little bit inclined to quit while I'm ahead, but since I've come all this distance, I think I'll go on with it. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be back here at the Kennedy School. I never feel like I'm very far from the Kennedy School. Uh, my eldest son graduated from here, as uh, Al said, and uh, 
we have a continuing flow of people in and out of government from the Kennedy School. Uh, Graham Allison uh, is just back, having contributed so much and been the architect of some of the policies that I'll be talking about. Uh, give him credit, but don't give him blame. Uh, Joe Nye, one of your very distinguished uh, professors, is now uh, on board and was with me uh, uh, in the last couple of days when I've been in Europe uh, meeting with Andrei Kosarev and uh, Secretary General Willie Kloss of NATO. So as I say, the, uh, the influence of, uh, of the uh, JFK school is enormous and I never feel very far from it. America stands today at the threshold of a new century and faces a challenge that recalls the dangers and the opportunities that confronted us at the end of the First and Second World Wars. Then as now, two distinct paths lay uh, before us, uh, either to claim victory and withdraw, or on the other hand, to provide American leadership to build a more peaceful, free, and prosperous world. After World War I, our leaders chose the first path, and uh, we in the world paid a terrible price. On the other hand, no one will dispute that after the Second World War, Harry Truman, George Marshall, Dean Acheson, Arthur Vandenberg, and most of all, the American people, wisely chose the other path. That same far-sighted commitment to American leadership and engagement must guide our foreign policy today. The Soviet Union is gone. No great power views any other as an immediate military threat. And the triumph of democracy and free markets is really transforming countries from Europe to Latin America and from Asia to Africa. We now have a remarkable opportunity to shape a world conducive to American interests and consistent with American values. A America, an America of open markets and open societies leading to a world of open markets and open societies. In the past year, we have helped persuade Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus to give up nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear warheads and missiles from these states and from Russia are being dismantled. Russian troops are out of the Baltics and out of Germany. We've begun to build a new European security architecture. We've helped to launch regional security dialogues in Asia. We've negotiated a framework agreement with North Korea that will ultimately eliminate its nuclear weapons program. We've reached an agreement with China that will sharply limit its nuclear exports. And we've stopped Iraqi aggression against Kuwait, stopped it dead in its tracks. We've also contributed to historic progress in resolving conflict backing democracy and promoting development in countries around the world. Just remember what's happened in just the last year or two. We fostered agreements between Israel and the PLO and the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. We restored the democratically elected government in Haiti and we're going to do our part to make sure that that achievement endures. In troubled regions like Northern Ireland, South Africa, and Cambodia, the United States contributed to extraordinary advances there to peace and reconciliation, and to take another development in a kind of a different sphere. In the historic Cairo conference, we restored American leadership on the critical issues of population and development. Finally, We've taken giant steps to build the open trading system for the next century with America at its hub. We won bipartisan support for the GATT agreement and led the way for its approval around the world. We helped to forge commitments to eliminate trade barriers in the Asia Pacific region by the year 2020. And we negotiated, uh, we, worked out commitments to negotiate free trade agreements in our own hemisphere by the year 2005. 
We've made important progress in widening access to Japan's markets. These are significant accomplishments of the last year or two, but uh, none of you would want us to rest on our laurels or our accomplishments, and certainly we do not. Aggression, tyranny, and intolerance still undermine political stability and economic development in vital regions of the world. Americans face growing threats from the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, from terrorism, and from international crime. And a number of problems that once seemed quite distant, problems like environmental degradation, unsustainable population growth, and the mass movement of refugees, problems like that now pose immediate threats to emerging democracies and to our global prosperity. In meeting these opportunities and dealing with these dangers, our foreign policy is driven by several principles. First, America must continue to engage and to lead. Second, we must maintain and strengthen our cooperative relationships with the world's most powerful nations. Third, it is essential that we adapt and build institutions that will promote economic security and cooperation. And fourth, we must continue to support democracy and human rights because it serves our interests, our ideals, and our values around the world. The first principle, the imperative of American leadership is essential to us. It's a central lesson of this century. It is really sobering to imagine what we, where the world would be like uh, if we had not provided that leadership in the last two years alone. If we had not, we might now have four nuclear states in the Soviet Union rather than just one. We might have a full throttle nuclear program in North Korea. We might have no GATT agreement or NAFTA. We might have still brutal dictators terrorizing Haiti. And to take just one other example, we might very possibly have had Iraqi troops back in Kuwait. As a global power with global interests, the United States must not retreat from its leadership role. It's our responsibility to ensure that the post-Cold War momentum toward freedom Prosperity is not reversed by neglect or by short-sighted indifference. Only the United States has the vision and the capacity to consolidate the many gains that have been made. As our most recent accomplishments suggest, American leadership requires that we be ready to back our diplomacy with credible threats of force, and to this end, President Clinton is determined that the United States military will remain the most powerful and the most effective fighting force in the world, and that certainly is what it is right now. When our vital interests are at stake, we must be prepared to act alone. Our willingness to do so is often the key to effective joint action. The recent debate between proponents of unilateral and multilateral action involves, in my judgment, a false choice. Multilateralism is a means, not an end. Sometimes by mobilizing the support of other nations, by leveraging our power and leading alliances and leading institutions, we will achieve better results at a lower cost in life and a lower cost in our national treasure. When we can do that, that's the kind of a sensible bargain that the American people want and will support. Leadership by the United States also means focusing international attention on emerging global problems. That's why we've given new and enhanced attention to global issues like the environment, population, and sustainable development. They deserve a prominent place in our foreign policy agenda, and as long as I am Secretary of State, they will have it. Just as our nation must maintain its military readiness, 
so we must be ready to advance our political and economic interests around the world through diplomacy. That requires highly trained men and women, it requires modern communication and technology, it requires adequate resources. There is an analogy at the State Department of the need for readiness that is exactly parallel to the analogy that there is at the Pentagon for our American troops. The second tenet of our strategy is the central importance of constructive relations with the world's most powerful nations. Our Western European allies to begin with, Japan, China, and Russia. These nations and groups of nations possess the political, economic, and military cap capability to affect, for good or for ill, the well-being of every American. The relatively cooperative relations that uh, these countries now have with each other is, I believe, unprecedented in this century, but it is not irreversible, and so we must work to keep it that way. Our strategy toward the great powers begins with Western Europe and Japan. We must revitalize our alliances with this democratic core, but we must also seize the opportunities to build constructive relations with China and Russia, countries that were not too long ago our fiercest ad adversaries. Both of those countries are undergoing momentous, so very different transformations that will directly affect American interests, and coping with this, coping with those transformations, has to be one of the primary obligations and responsibilities of the Secretary of State. Our partnership with Japan is the linchpin of our policy toward Asia, the world's most dynamic region. This administration has placed Asia at the core of our long-term foreign policy approach. Realizing President Clinton's vision of a stable and prosperous Pacific community will continue to be a top priority. Asia figures prominently in our areas of central emphasis for 1995. It is also imperative that we enforce our security and political ties with Japan, as well as South Korea and our other treaty allies uh, in the Pacific. It is equally essential that the strength of our economic ties with Japan match the overall strength of our relationship. During this year that marks the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, we will, we will highlight and heighten our close cooperation with Japan on regional and global issues, while at the same time continuing to press for greater access to the Japanese market. Our success in Asia also requires pursuing constructive relations with China. We must do that. We must make that pursuit consistent with our overall interests. We welcome China's participation in regional security and economic organizations. We support its succession to the World Trade Organization on proper terms, and we'll work hard to gain its cooperation with global non-proliferation regimes. In China's own interests, and consistent with, our, with its increasing role in the world community, it needs to demonstrate greater respect for human rights and the rule of law. China's recent crackdown on dissent, on dissent is disturbing, and it's incompatible with the realization to the full extent of the possibility and potential of its relations with, with the United States. Our relationship with Russia is also central to America's security. It has been a key foreign policy issue for this administration, and its importance, of course, is reflected in my meetings this very week in Geneva with Andrei Kosarev, where for more than eight hours, we discussed a broad array of common challenges and common concerns. We have a, an enormous stake in the outcome of Russia's continuing transformation. A stable democratic Russia is vital to a secure Europe. It's vital to resolve regional conflicts. 
and it's very important in the fight against proliferation, pardon me. An unstable Russia that reverts to authoritarianism or slides into chaos would be a disaster. An immediate threat to its neighbors with its huge nuclear stockpile and once again a strategic threat to the United States. That's why our administration has been unwavering in our support for Russian reform. Despite the setbacks that we knew Russia might encounter during this historic and difficult transition, our steady policy of engagement and cooperation has so far paid off for every American, from reducing the nuclear threat to advancing peace in the Middle East. That's why President Clinton reaffirmed last week in Cleveland his determination to Maine to maintain our substantial assistance for democratic and economic reform in Russia. We are, as all of you are, deeply concerned about the conflict in Chechnya. It's a terrible human tragedy. The way the Russians have used force there has been excessive and it threatens to have a corrosive effect on the entire future of Russian democracy. That's why I emphasized so strongly to Foreign Minister Kosarev in Geneva this week the conflict must come to an end, and the process of reconcili re reconciliation must begin, taking into account the views of the people of Chech Chechnya and providing humanitarian assistance for them. What we do not want to see is a Russia in a military quagmire that erodes reform and tends to isolate it in the international community. Pardon me. The third principle of our strategy is that if the historic movement toward open societies and open markets is to endure, we must adapt and revitalize the institutions of global and regional cooperation. After World War II, the generation of Truman, Marshall, Acheson built great institutions that gave structure and strength to the common enterprise of Western democracies, promoting peace, promoting economic growth. Our challenge now is to modernize and revitalize those institutions, great institutions like NATO, the UN, the IMF, World Bank, OECD, and others. And we must also find ways to extend the benefits and the obligations of these great institutions to the new democracies and market economies of Central and Eastern Europe. At President Clinton's initiative, our G7 partners agreed that in Halifax next July, we will chart a strategy to adapt the post-war institutions to the more integrated post-Cold War period. We're also helping regional institutions and structures such as the Organization of American States, ASEAN, and the Organization of American Unity to promote peace and democratic development. As we go forward into the next century, we'll find ourselves relying more and more on these regional institutions. As a fourth principle, this administration recognizes the importance of democracy and human rights as a fundamental part of our foreign policy. Our commitment is consistent with American ideals but it also rests on a sober assessment of our long-term interests in a world where stability is reinforced by accountability, where disputes are mediated by dialogue, a world where information flows freely and the rule of law protects not only political rights, but provides the essential elements for progress in free market economies. Having laid down these four basic principles of our policy, I'd now like to tell you that in the new year, 1995, as we follow these underlying principles, I intend that we focus on five key areas that seem to me to offer particularly significant opportunities. They are advancing the most open global trading system in history, developing a new European security structure, helping achieve a comprehensive peace in the Middle East, combating the spread of weapons of mass destruction, and fighting international crime, narcotics, and terrorism. 
First, we must sustain the momentum we've generated toward the more open global and regional trade that is so vital to American exports and good jobs for Americans. A core premise of our domestic and foreign policies is that our economic strength at home and abroad are mutually reinforcing. I truly believe that history will judge that this emphasis on the interrelationship between economics at home and abroad will be regarded as a distinctive imprint and a lasting legacy of the Clinton administration. To carry this out, we will implement the Uruguay Round and ensure that the New World Trade Organization upholds vital trade rules and disciplines. We'll work with Japan and the other partners in APEC to develop a blueprint for achieving open trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region by 2020. We'll begin to implement the Summit of the Americas Action Plan for free trade in this hemisphere by 2005. And we'll begin in this hemisphere by negotiating a extension of NAFTA to Chile. Let me add a word about something that's on our minds today, and that is Mexico and our effort to address the economic crisis of confidence in that country. The president, I believe, has demonstrated unusually good vision and leadership in assembling a package of support which will be necessary to help Mexico get back on track. The package of loan guarantees has the backing not only of our administration, but the bipartisan congressional leadership, and the chairman of the Federal Reserve, as well as the other international financial institutions. This package contains tough but fair conditions to protect the U.S. interests and to ensure that the guarantees are used wisely and well. As the President has said, however, we should resist the temptation to load up this package with conditions that are unrelated to the economic thrust of the effort. Let me say this to Congress and the American people. This package is in the overriding interest of the United States. It should be acted upon quickly and favorably. In our second area of opportunity in 1995, we'll take concrete steps to build a new European security architecture. We understand that deep political, military, economic, cultural ties make Europe's prosperity and security essential to ours. It has been so for at least a century. Our efforts will focus on maintaining strong relationships with Western Europe, consolidating the new democracies of Central Europe and the former Soviet Union, and engaging Russia as a responsible partner. NATO remains the anchor of American engagement in Europe and the linchpin of our transatlantic security. NATO has always been far more than a transitory response to a temporary threat. It's been the guarantor of European democracy and a force for European stability. That is why its mission has endured, and that is why its benefits are so attractive to Europe's new democracies to the East. In earlier years, NATO has welcomed new members who shared its purposes and who could add to its strength. Under American leadership, the alliance has agreed uh, last December to begin a steady, deliberate process that will lead to further expansion. We've also already begun to examine with our allies the process and objectives of expansion. We intend to share our conclusions of this study with the Partnership for Peace members before the end of this year. As we move toward NATO expansion, we will also bolster key elements of the new European security architecture, a vigorous program of the Partnership for Peace, which now includes 24 nations, a strengthened organization for security and cooperation in Europe, now called the OSCE, and a process for enhancing the NATO-Russia relationship, which will take place during the year 1995. The tragic war in Bosnia underscores the building the importance of building effective new architecture for conflict prevention and resolution in Europe. 
Together with our partners in the contact group, we're seeking a negotiated solution in Bosnia because only a negotiated solution has any chance of lasting and of preventing a wider war. What we must not do in this situation is to make it worse by unilaterally lifting the arms embargo. We have always believed, of course, that the arms embargo is unfair, but going alone to lift it would lead to a withdrawal of unfor and an escalation of violence. It would Americanize the conflict and lead others to abandon the sanctions on Serbia. It would undermine the authority of the UN Security Council resolution, including resolutions that impose sanctions on Libya and Iraq, for example. Our third area of opportunity is advancing peace and security in the Middle East. We have witnessed in the last two years a profound transformation of the landscape of the Arab-Israeli conflict, one that would simply not have been imaginable just a few years ago. Of course there are difficulties, but despite those difficulties, we must not let this remarkable opportunity slip away. On the Israeli-Palestinian track, we must continue to make progress in the implementation of the Declaration of Principles. It's not a straight line by any means, but uh, I was once again encouraged, as I hope you were, by yesterday's meeting between Prime Minister Rabin and Chairman Arafat, and by the serious efforts that both sides are, make, are making to work out the complex issues involved in the next phase where there will be self-government in the entire West Bank. Israelis must gain security in this process. Palestinians must achieve genuine control over political and economic decisions that affect their lives. Each of them must build the trust and confidence of the other, especially at a time when those opposed to peace are finding ways to try to undermine and destroy this necessary mutual confidence. Again in the Middle East, the negotiations between Israel and Syria are entering a very crucial phase. The parties are serious and some progress has been made in narrowing the gaps. If a breakthrough is to be achieved in the next few months, critical decisions must be made by the parties and the process must be accelerated. I assure you that President Clinton and I and our administration will do all we can as we continue to support these efforts toward peace in the Middle East. As we promote peace in the Middle East, we must also face the responsibility of dealing with the enemies of peace. Iraq's massing of troops at the Kuwait border last December underscore the danger that Iraq poses to regional security and peace. It is uh, my conviction and that I think of all who I've talked in the Middle East among the leaders there that Saddam Hussein's regime simply cannot be trusted. Full compliance with all relevant UN obligations is the only possible basis on which to consider any relaxation of the sanctions against Iraq. Another rogue state, Iran, is leading the rejectionist efforts to kill the chances for peace in the Middle East. It directs and materially supports the operations of Hezbollah, Hamas, and others, operations that uh, create atrocities in places as far flung as Tel Aviv and Buenos Aires. Uh, it Iran sows terror and subversion across the entire Arab world. Those industrialized nations that continue to provide concessionary credits to Iran cannot escape the consequences of their actions. They make it easier for Iran to use its resources to sponsor terrorism and to undermine the prospects for peace. Today, Iran is engaged in a crash effort to develop nuclear weapons. We're deeply concerned that some nations are prepared to cooperate with Iran in the nuclear field. About that, I will not mince words. These efforts risk the, risk the security of the entire Middle East. 
The United States places the highest priority on denying Iran a nuclear weapons capability. We expect the members of the Security Council who have special responsibilities in this area to join with us in doing so. Our fourth area of emphasis for 1995 is to take specific steps to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery. With the demise of the Soviet Union, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction poses, in my judgment, the principal threat to the survival of the United States and our key allies. Our global and regional strategies for 1995 com comprise, I believe, the most ambitious nonproliferation agenda in history. The centerpiece of our global strategy is the indefinite and unconditional extension of the Nonproliferation Treaty, which is up for renewal this year, as you know. The treaty's greatest achievement is an invisible one, weapons not built, material not diverted. But the impact of the treaty is clear. The nightmare of a profusion of nuclear weapon states simply has not come to pass. I think that history will record that the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty is probably one of the most important treaties of all time. Our global strategy also includes a moratorium on nuclear testing as we negotiate a comprehensive test ban treaty, a global ban on the production of fissile materials for building nuclear weapons is also on the agenda, as is ratification of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the strengthening of the Biological Weapons Convention. With the agreements that President Clinton signed last uh, December in Budapest, we can now begin to implement START One, the Nuclear Reduction Treaty called START One. Later this month, I'll be the administration's lead witness in urging the Senate to promptly ratify START Two. Finally, we will continue to support the Nunlugar program, which has been so important in providing the funds to help dismantle the former nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union and to counter would-be smugglers by improving security at vulnerable facilities in the former Soviet Union. On another very important nonproliferation issue, when this administration took office, North Korea had an active nuclear program. Left unchallenged, it uh, was poised to produce hundreds of kilograms of plutonium that could be used in nuclear weapons. The stage was set for a crisis that would imperil security in Northeast Asia and undermine our entire global nonproliferation regime. Last fall, the United States concluded an agreed framework with North Korea, a framework that freezes its nuclear program, provides for its dismantlement, and puts the whole issue on the road to resolution. The framework has the strong support of Japan and Korea, key allies whose security it will protect and who will finance most of its implementation. Of course, we're under no illusions about North Korea. Implementation of the agreed framework will be based upon verification, not trust. We are determined to ensure that North Korea fulfills every obligation at every step of this program. We can check it step by step. Those who oppose the framework with North Korea have a heavy responsibility to offer an effective alternative that protects our interests and the interests of our allies uh, in Northern Asia. To this point, they certainly have not done so. We also have an aggressive strategy with respect to conventional arms and missiles. We will seek to broaden the missile technology control regime, so often called MTCR. We'll also push for a global agreement to ban anti-personnel mines, one of the real scourges of the world. We're going to work bilaterally to remove the millions of mines that are still in place, so many countries around the world. And we'll be also seeking to establish a successor to the COCOM regime, which will restrain trade and arm, I'm sorry, will restrain trade in arms and sensitive technologies, uh, especially 
trade of that kind to the pariah states around the world. Turning to our fifth area, last area of emphasis in 1995, international terrorists, criminals, and drug traffickers are posing direct threats to our people and to our nation's interests. They ruin countless lives, destroy property, siphon away productive resources. They sap the strength of the industrialized societies of the world, and even more gravely, they threaten the survival of emerging democracies. That's why in 1995, we plan to implement a comprehensive strategy to combat these threats. The State Department is working on a plan uh, in this direction in close and urgent cooperation with the Departments of Treasury and Justice and other law enforcement agencies. The strategy on international crime and terrorism will take several vital steps this year, and I want to hear today uh, outline just three or four steps which will mark the initiation of this a vital new program. First, we will insist that other countries fulfill their obligations either to extradite or prosecute international fu fugitives, fugitives and to ensure that convicted criminals serve tough sentences in their countries. Second, we'll work with other governments to develop and imp implement a tough asset forfeiture law and tough money laundering laws to attack international criminals in a vulnerable, very vulnerable place in their pocketbooks. Unfortunately, many countries have relatively weak laws as far as asset forfeiture and money laundering goes. Third, we'll toughen standards for obtaining visas to the United States, States so as to make it more difficult for international criminals to gain entry into this country. Fourth, we will propose legislation to combat alien smuggling and immigration fraud by providing increased penalties and more effective investigative tools. And fifth, the Clinton administration is planning new steps to expand the use of U.S. law against terrorists, against the funding of terrorists and their worldwide activities. I've discussed today five key areas of opportunity uh, for American foreign policy in 1995. But I also want to underscore that our foreign policy will continue to address a whole range of other important issues, issues such as promoting stability and democracy in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, meeting humanitarian needs around the world, fighting environmental degradation, and addressing rapid population growth. As I conclude, let me note that since my first week in office, I have consulted closely with both parties of Congress on every important issue on our agenda. We've gained bipartisan backing for our key objectives in the foreign policy field, including, for example, our approach in the Middle East, our landmark trade agreements such as NAFTA, GAF, and GATT, and APEC, and our uh, relations with the Soviet Union, and especially the denuclearization of the Soviet Union. The Recent elections may have changed the balance of power between the parties, but they did not change. Indeed, they enhanced our responsibility to cooperate on a bipartisan basis in the field of foreign affairs. The election was not a license to lose sight of our nation's global interests or to walk away from our commitments in the world. Leaders of both parties understand that well, and I'm glad to tell you that my extensive meetings with the new Republican leadership give me great confidence that we'll be able to forge once again the bipartisan foreign policy that is characteristic and traditional in America. Bipartisan cooperation has always been grounded in the conviction that our nation's enduring interests do not vary with the times. President Harry Truman had it right 40 years ago when he said, circumstances change, but the great issues remain. Prosperity, welfare, human rights, effective democracy, and above all, peace. With the Cold War behind us, the United States has a chance to build a more secure and integrated world of open societies and open markets. We're the world's largest military and economic power. Our nation's founding principles 
still inspire people all over the world. We're blessed with great resources and great resolve. We'll continue to use them with wisdom and with strength and with the backing of the American people. Thank you very much. time for questions. I ask you please keep the questions short. Uh, identify yourself uh, briefly and let's make sure there are questions. We'll start right here. Okay. Uh, Secretary, Secretary of State Christopher, my name is David Abrams and I'm a freshman at Harvard College this year. I have two questions uh, regarding the present administration's defense policies in the next two years. Uh, the first is since the Republican Congress recently has said that they're going to plan to increase defense spending, and Clinton has said he'll go along with it um, in the next two years. Do you plan to reverse policies of reducing overseas troops, or will most of the increased spending be domestic? My second question. We have, one, we have more people than we have time okay. for questions. So one question to a customer. There will be a increased uh, defense spending, I believe, uh, according to uh, an announcement that President Clinton recently made, and the focus of that will be on improved readiness. Uh, but uh, that being said, I want to emphasize that there is no intention to uh, change our commitments abroad. We will maintain approximately 100,000 troops um, in Europe, which is a very, very substantial contingent in Europe. And we will maintain our forward basing and approximately as many troops um, in the Asia-Pacific region, including the 37,000 troops which uh, stand guard in, um, in the Republic of Korea. So uh, we're going to be keeping our commitments uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, as I say, I believe the, the principal use of the additional funds that President Clinton identified will be to ensure readiness. I must say I've spent some time with the American troops recently, both in Kuwait and Haiti, and their performance is absolutely extraordinary and superb, and their readiness, uh, the readiness of the troops I saw uh, is magnificent. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Matt Anessis, and I'm a senior at the college. Uh, Secretary Christopher, um, I was wondering what your opinions were uh, about the effectiveness and um, appropriateness of, uh, of prominent Americans like Jimmy Carter and Colin Powell acting as uh, acting as liaisons to other countries uh, in the hot spots of the world? Well, taking the two uh, names you mentioned, uh, I think judged by the results, uh, uh, what they've done has been very effective. Uh, uh, President uh, Carter was instrumental in uh, bringing the uh, Korean, North Koreans to the negotiating table. Uh, his action with his, in, in, in Haiti and his action once again in Bosnia has come at a moment when uh, uh, they were instrumental in, in producing some forward movement. I think it's best to judge them by the results and judged by the results. Uh, uh, those efforts have been effective. Uh, President Carter was uh, uh, very careful himself and very fulsome to give credit to uh, uh, Senator Sam Nunn and uh, uh, General Colin Powell uh, said that uh, what he had achieved in Haiti would not have been possible without them. So. Uh, I don't want to make a rule for all seasons, and of course there are, it needs to be done in, in conjunction with American foreign policy, which must be conducted by the President and the Secretary of State, but judged by results, I'd have to say uh, President Carter has, in 1994, produced good results for the United States. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for visiting the campus. You have a very difficult job. I admire you. Um, any thoughts on uh, reorganizing our international development assistance effort in terms of AID and USIA and the, this recent idea to incorporate those agencies into the Department of State? Uh, several weeks ago, after the election, uh, the Vice President uh, uh, sent to each of the departments in government a memorandum 
asking us to think big and think broadly and to examine ways in which uh, uh, money might be saved and our operations made more effective through reorganization or consolidation. Uh, in that vein, uh, the Vice President's reinventing government process has been considering the possible reorganization of, the of, the, of those various entities that are involved in the international affairs, the, the State Department, uh, USIA, AID, and ACTA. Uh, that process is, is ongoing at the present time. Uh, uh, the Vice President, with a, a team of experts, is looking at ways to uh, consolidate, to make more effective, uh, to save some money with respect to, to those institutions. And since the process is, is ongoing and it'll be up to the President and the Vice President to make uh, the ultimate recommendations to Congress on that, I think I won't go beyond that. But I will say it seems to me to be always wise for, for government to have the flexibility and creativity to wonder if a new way of approaching the problem might not save the taxpayers some money and perhaps most important, enable us to do our job more effectively. And that's what's going on at the present time in the Vice President's so-called reinventing government process. Hello, Secretary Christopher. My name is William Zerhouni. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is this. What exactly will our policy be to halt the spread of Islamic fundamentalism in the Middle East and North Africa, especially in regards to nations such as Algeria and Egypt? Well, here I would want to evoke some comments that the the president made uh, when he was visiting the Middle East and, and spoke uh, to the parliament in Jordan. He emphasized that the United States uh, does not have any quarrel with the religion of Islam. Indeed, we respect it and uh, we have many, share many of the same fundamental values. But uh, where you come to radicalism and extremism uh, that uh, prevents the operation of government and is involved and involved in in terrorism and killing, of course, that needs to be resisted. My own uh, experience with this is that uh, that kind of extremism, that kind of radicalism feeds best, perhaps it feeds only at all on uh, great misery, great economic woe. And I think one of the reasons the United States is promoting economic development around the world is to try to ensure that uh, the people of the world ha have a better life and feel less need to uh, uh, reach out for the kind of extremist radical solutions that are involved there. Uh, we, we think that those extremists are the enemies of the Middle East peace process. And when you're in the Middle East at the present time, there are two uh, trends that are countervailing trends at, at war with each other. You, you find the uh, trend toward peace between Israel and its neighbors, transforming the landscape, things happening that you could not have believed several years ago, relations between Israel and its neighbors opening up, Israelis visiting Jordan and vice versa. On the other hand, you have the uh, uh, extremist uh, movements uh, financed by Iran. You have uh, the, the, the rump states such as uh, Iraq, uh, trying to sow the seeds of unrest and trying to undermine the peace process. And the United States is going to be squarely on the side of the former tendency, doing all we can to encourage peace and, and, and stability and encouraging developments such as the Casablanca Conference, which uh, meant that not only there's the possibility for peace in the Middle East, but for a new era of prosperity if we work at it. And so I think that's the... That's the core of the United States policy, to support those who take risks for peace and to try to help the transformation of the Middle East to an, to an era and an area of, uh, of, of peace and prosperity. Secretary Christopher, my name is David King. Welcome. Thank I'm you. a professor at the Kennedy School. I teach about and a student, I'm a student of uh, legislatures here and around the world. So I'm going to ask a question that may be of interest to those of us that care about legislatures here and around the world. Uh, legislatures are critical in the transition towards a democracy, uh, the popular assemblies, uh, popularly elected. The Russian Duma is popularly elected, doesn't have nearly the power that the uh, US Congress does. 
We had members of the Russian Duma here for two weeks. They expressed great frustration and bewilderment um, and what they saw as treatment by the State Department uh, to them. They think they're being ignored and they see their assembly as a training ground for future leaders uh, of, the, of, the, of Russia. Could you clarify for us and clarify for the members of the Russian Duma the State Department's view of uh, this assembly? I'm always uh, uh, concerned and sometimes mystified when uh, people uh, describe the views of the State Department. Uh, it, uh, State Department is, is a building. Uh, people have <laughs> views. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what building it is that, that has those views about the Duma. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, we respect the Duma as a very important parliamentary uh, uh, body, uh, one that we should get to know better, one that will have a very important place in, in Russian life. And I wish that uh, the people who were here, uh, uh, I wish I had known that they felt that way because I would have invited them to come to Washington so we could meet with them and have a dialogue with them. Uh, the, the Duma will, will play a significant role in, in Russian life uh, as it uh, begins to form its procedures and begins to uh, take its proper place uh, in, in the transformation of that great country. Wasn't it interesting just within the last 10 days that President Yeltsin has added to his Security Council the Speaker of both the upper and the lower house uh, of the Duma. And isn't it interesting that in this period of great tension and pressure in Russia, President Yeltsin has not taken any steps to try to rein in the Duma or indeed taken any steps to try to limit the media coverage. Uh, a, Chechen is a tragedy, but you look at the situation and at least to find the encouragement that uh, the Duma is an operation, the debate goes forward at the Duma, uh, the press is free reporting in excruciating, painful detail what's happening in Chechen. So democracy is beginning to flower and, and work in, in Russia, even if in very painful ways. And, as far as the Duma is concerned, I hope if you have other visitors from the Duma that you'll let us know so that we can interact with them in the proper way. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon. My, my name is Adrian Marks, and I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. My question is regarding Haiti and the planned end of March transition of the U.S. led operation to one led by the United Nations, a situation very similar to that in Somalia exactly two years ago. My question is this. What lessons did the U.S. learn from Somalia that can now be applied to Haiti to first ensure a more effective and smooth transition to the United Nations, and secondly, can help for greater success of that U.N. mission? For example, will the, UN, will the U.S. maintain a senior official in any capacity in the U.N. organization? And in what relationship will any remaining U.S. troops in Haiti have with their U.N. counterparts? Well, that's a very well-informed and searching question. Uh, with respect to Somalia, let me say that uh, we have tried to learn the lessons of, of Somalia, and we'll try to be profit uh, from them in, in, in what is done in, in Haiti. The, the situations are have some analogies, but they are really quite dissimilar. I'd like to emphasize that the United States multinational force, that is the United States-led multinational force, will not be leaving Haiti until the commander of that force certifies to the United, United Nations and the Security Council finds that there is a safe and secure environment. We are on the verge of that time, but I would not expect the transition to take place immediately. After the transition takes place, the United States will still have a very substantial force there numerically probably just less than half of the 6,000 uh, 6, troops that remain in, in Haiti after the transfer from the multinational force uh, to the United Nations-led force. Uh, the United States uh, will continue to command the United Nations force with the United States Lieutenant General in command of the 6,000 uh, 6, person United Nations force. Uh, the situation in, in Haiti is far better than the situation has been in, in, in Somalia. The, the chief of police of New York, uh, former chief of police of New York, 
Chief Kelly said the other day that uh, the, the situation in Port-au-Prince and from the standpoint of, of criminal law is better than in American cities of comparable size. We've got lots of work to do. That's not very good, is it? <laughs> uh, we, we have lots of work to do in, in Haiti, but the United States is not going to uh, walk away from that situation. We're going to continue to participate. But we must turn the corner uh, toward uh, the development of that country, toward the improvement of the economic life of the people, because once again, uh, there lies probably the, the main factor in, in foretelling the future of that country. But the police are being trained and professionalized. The army is being downsized and made more professional. Uh, economic development goes forward. And I think there's a as long as we continue to work at it, as long as we don't walk away from it, as long as it engages our attention, I think the prospects are, are bright uh, in Haiti and being close at hand and with the kind of commitment we've had through the multinational force, the United States will, will stay engaged. Hello, Secretary Christopher. My name is Ashok Parmeshwar and I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. My question is about a country which you haven't yet addressed, uh, India. Um, it seems that the U.S. faces challenges in India similar to those that it faces in China. How will the U.S. balance its concerns over nuclear nonproliferation, human rights in Kashmir, and Indo-Pak relations against its support for the economic reforms that are taking place there? Uh, my, my colleague, uh, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, uh, just returned from a trip to India and Pakistan. And I look forward to getting with, together with him over the weekend to get his insights uh, on, on India. Uh, you've asked a whole range of questions. Let me simply comment that uh, uh, India is one of the uh, great emerging powers, uh, great emerging markets. American businessmen are extremely interested in, in the Indian market. And I think our relations with India are gradually improving. Uh, it is a, is a situation where we are quite determined through uh, careful diplomacy and understanding uh, of the situation in India to seek a, a, a strong improvement in our, in our relations uh, with India. Uh, the nuclear situation in both India and Pakistan has long been a matter of, of worry uh, to the United States and, and the rest of the world. And, I think the most that I would want to say about that on, on, at this, uh, on this occasion is that uh, we, we see the need to ensure that there not be a, a growth or expansion of the nuclear capability or of the, of the delivery capability in those two countries. And we'll be working uh, carefully, steadily with, with both India and Pakistan, recognizing both of their histories and both of their interests to try to ensure that they do not present a, a nuclear threat uh, to each other or to the rest of the world. I'm afraid I'm going to have to do this. <laughs> uh, I've just gotten the word. One of the great uh, privileges of this uh, job is to welcome people like Secretary Christopher. Uh, one of the responsibilities is to have to call sessions like this to an end because we've run out of time. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for, for hearing me out today. I wanted to come up here and present basically my agenda for 1995. Uh, it was uh, fairly dense and fairly long. Sorry, I was a little late because I had a little difficulty getting into the airport. The pilots had a trouble finding a hole in, in the fog today. But thank you for being such an attentive and good audience and for your fine questions. It's been great to be back here at the Kennedy Center. Al, I look forward to coming again if you'll invite me. Anytime. Thank <laughs> you.